He fought in Vietnam and went on to become the spokesman for the Australian Defence Force. After that, Brigadier Adrian Darge handled military security for the Sydney Olympics in 2000. Unknown to many, he began writing novels during his travels with the ADF and though he received many rejections, he eventually won over the publishing world. He has degrees in theology and wine chemistry and is working on a doctorate on US foreign policy in the Middle East, having recently released his latest thriller, The Inca Prophecy. Adrian Darje, welcome to One Plus One. Pleasure. You went to North Sydney Boys, and I understand that you organised the theft of the school's entire <laughs> furniture inventory in a military-style operation. Your Why? research is impeccable, ma'am. Uh, perhaps a forerunner to uh, a career in the, uh, in, in the military, but more a rebellious spirit, I think. Why rebellious? Well, I've always rebelled against authority, even though I had 37 years in the military. In fact, many of my colleagues were surprised that I made it past Lance Corporal. But, <laughs> but the theft of the furniture, yes, I guess I can admit to that these days. It meant, uh, and I organised a squad of 15, and we had uh, people up on the roofs of the, the high schools, and I knew when the police patrols were, uh, when and where they were moving and uh, we froze if, if a police patrol came past, but we hid every st stick of furniture. And it meant we virtually got a, a day off. How we never got caught for that, I'm not quite sure. So was that <laughs> the purpose, to have a day off? Of course. <laughs> uh, and I guess um, a rebellion against authority. I mean, I was a, a trombone player. Uh, I rose to the dizzy heights of sergeant, first trombonist in the band and then promptly got busted back to corporal for smoking and busted back to private for drinking. So did you grow up in a loving household? Yes and no. Uh, my uh, father was a World War II veteran. I think suffered deeply from what is now known as post-traumatic stress disorder and perhaps not widely recognised back then. Uh, a very short fuse and uh, quite a violent man in terms of discipline. Uh, I suffered a lot of physical abuse at his hands. Um, Is that what made you rebellious? I think it certainly had, uh, was part and parcel of it. I probably wasn't the ideal son, but, but nevertheless, I don't think there's any excuse for that. Uh, I now know why, uh, but that was part of the rebellion. Um, so if you were rebellious, if your father was, was sometimes physically abusive towards you, why the military? It was a toss-up between the military and the priesthood. After all, they're such wow. similar <laughs> careers. But Jane, I was brought up in, that, uh, in the 50s uh, and it was a conservative household. I went to St Luke's in, in Mossman, I sang in the choir. Um, and in those days, it, it's what I now call the theology of fear. If you didn't conform to every one of the Ten Commandments, you were going to burn in hell. And the church has, for centuries, tried to exercise that control. And it's something that I rebelled against later in life. I guess the brochures of the military were glossier than those of the church. And I went off to, uh, to Duntroon and uh, subsequently finished up in uh, Vietnam as a platoon commander. But uh, it took me a long time to rebel against that theological upbringing, if you like. And, and how long did it take you to rebel against the military? Because obviously you were fighting in Vietnam. You've won several commendations as, as someone who's been a fighter. Why didn't you rebel against that? Well, firstly, I think you know, any awards that I might have for military service are part and parcel of the wonderful people that worked around me and, and in the case of Vietnam, the extraordinary uh, heroism of the, of the soldiers involved. Uh, I guess when I got back, yes, my mindset had changed. Um, when you get into close quarter fighting in the jungle and, you know, one of, one of my soldiers had over a dozen bullet bullet holes in him. He, he lived, but it's ugly, it's brutal. And so many politicians today commit us to warfare without giving diplomacy uh, a 
a, a go. I mean, Bush, Blair and Howard are just a number in a long line of those politicians. So my mindset changed, but I also enjoyed the military. I mean, I commanded a battalion. Um, that was great fun. Um, later on, I was given the job of uh, um, media chief, and uh, I enjoyed that from a mental perspective. Media chief of an organisation that likes to keep a lot of secrets. Yes, I'm not sure that I could do it today. I'm glad you asked me about India. Let me tell you about Canada. <laughs> Very similar countries. So, so why do you say you couldn't do it today? Look, uh, I, I was the head of uh, defence media and PR. I had a lot to do with your colleagues, particularly in the gallery. Um, we forged over time a relationship uh, which was very strong with a half a dozen or so that I could go off the record. Uh, but why couldn't I do it today? Because I don't believe in government policy that so quickly goes off to, uh, to war in Afghanistan. At least we had the international community on side, but that disastrous exercise in Iraq I simply could not do it today. While you were working in defence public relations, which was before the Sydney Olympics in 2000, was there ever an issue that you basically had to, to cover up? Oh, often. Often. Um, what well, was let, me, let me clarify that. Uh, I would never lie to a journalist, ever, because ultimately the truth will out, as we've seen so often. So if the journalist didn't ask the right question, I wouldn't necessarily say, I mean that... You, you wouldn't give them something that they didn't specifically no, ask for? No. While you were in the Australian military, were you aware of the problems that we've seen in the last few years of the sex scandals, of cadets misbehaving? Has that always yes. taken place? Look, when I was a cadet at Duntroon, it was called bastardisation. We went in with 107 cadets and graduated with 47. Looking back on that, it was beyond the pale. I had the sort of personality that sort of said, oh, well, you go with the flow. But some of them went too far. It crosses the line and it's, it's getting that balance. And I think the only way to get that balance is to remove it. There have been several attempts at it. To a certain extent, what goes on on the campus of ADFA is no different to any campus on any university. But there's a line. And unfortunately, uh, in recent times, that's been crossed. You left the military after the um, Olympic Games. Did you always harbour thoughts of writing novels? I think so. Um, when I was Director of Joint Operations running the Defence Command Centre, the Nerve Centre, I was staying in a hotel and it was either go to the bar or uh, do something productive. So I wrote my first novel. It has enough rejection slips to paper your entire studio. It's a very large one. <laughs> I know what's wrong with it now. Um, apart from poor structure, uh, lack of character depth, lack of pace, it's a bloody good read. <laughs> <laughs> so and one day I keep telling my publisher, Penguin, it will get published. But every time I mention this historical novel, they say, oh, yes, the historical. Now, could we move on? Um, so we will see. So, so you always harboured thoughts of, of being a novelist, but you also went on to study theology. You seem to be an inveterate expert at, at anything that takes your fancy. Why study theology? And then I believe you said when you exited that you were of no particular religion. The marketing <laughs> department says theologian, scientist, adventurer, but the marketing department would say that. I am, a, uh, I, have, I am both blessed and cursed with an inquiring mind. But I think the, the degree in theology was more, uh, okay, I got the call in the late 80s that perhaps... Uh, you know, I should try and have an impact on, on what the world was, was up to and I might do this through Christianity. I could never have been more wrong. Um, this happens sometimes when you study theology. Uh, but I, I went on to do an honours degree and came out scratching my head. Religion is mainly an accident of birth. 
Now, if you and I were born in Baghdad, we'd be Sunni or Shiite. We wouldn't be Christian. We would be taught as little tackers about Muhammad's ascension into heaven, not Christ's. I don't happen to believe in either, although I respect those who might on either side. I wonder, you've written about conspiracies, poisoning of water supplies. What calamity do you fear the most? Nuclear. So plutonium, one kilogram equals 20,000 tonnes of TNT, which is what we dropped on Nagasaki. Suitcase bomb, if you overcome the, the nuclear physics, which is fearsome, with 10 kilograms of plutonium is 200,000 tonnes of TNT. It puts the suicide bomber in just a, a, an horrific dimension, reaches 50 million degrees at its initiation, winds of 800 kilometres an hour, everything turns to plasma in the immediate vicinity, and the hundreds of... It would wipe Sydney off the map. Well, that's a happy note to end the interview <laughs> on. Adrian Darje, thank you very much for joining Pleasure, One Plus One.